Well, welcome everyone to Stars, Cells, and God, a podcast where we talk about the latest discoveries on the in the book of nature that give us more evidence uh, for the reliability and truth of the book of scripture and for the uh, Christian faith. And if you're not already a subscriber to our YouTube channel, uh, go to YouTube. You can subscribe for free. We post all these podcasts there and other venues as well. Well, today I'm joined by uh, Jeff Zwerink. And, uh, you know, Jeff, uh, we're kind of mixing up a bit today. You're going to talk about something that's more theoretical and in your area of discipline, astronomy and cosmology. Uh, I'm going to talk about something more observational outside of my uh, discipline. I'm going to talk about uh, geophysics and paleontology, life sciences, etc. So we've got a good mix here. But how about if you start off first? about uh, the discovery or or theoretical development that you want to discuss. Well, thanks, Hugh. I appreciate the time to be here. And, uh, you know, one of the things you're you're talking about how what we find as we study creation and how that points to the truth of Scripture. And one of the things that I see in Scripture that virtually all Christians agree on is that the universe began to exist. Uh, You know, they can argue about where does the Bible talk about that and uh, you know, but you start out in Genesis one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I love, right. I loved your the first time I heard your your description of that. That it's not God created the heavens and God created the earth. That God is creating the totality of the physical realm. Right. Uh, you know, all the space, time, matter, and energy. And it, you know, it seems like that's a pervasive theme throughout Scripture. That uh, regardless of the time scales or whatever you're dealing with, that there is. A place where, you know, the way I would describe it is if you run time backwards, eventually you run into a boundary where nothing, nothing exists. Um, the challenge, though, in doing that is as a scientist, you say, how do you how would you measure the beginning of the universe? Well, you know, if you talk about the beginning of Jeff's wearing, that's not too hard because you can take measurements where Jeff's wearing did and Jeff's wearing didn't exist. But by definition, we can't measure something before the universe. And so what does that actually look like? And uh, you know, even going back to 19, the late 1980s, where I first was introduced to some of your work, realizing that there are these theorems that scientists can develop that show that as you run time backwards, you run into this boundary, if you will. And, uh, you know, just I wrote a book on escaping the beginning. It really helped me articulate and understand what it is scientists are doing that weigh in on whether the universe had a beginning. It's not measuring T equals zero. It's asking the question, how far back does the universe go and is there a place where there's a boundary? And one of the the things that you had commented in your book was, uh, I think it was Fingerprint of God was where I first saw it, was that uh, there are these singularity theorems where, uh, you know, the Hawking Penrose singularity theorem is probably the most popular that's talked about, where, uh, you know, again, if you run time backwards, eventually you run into this beginning. But every one of those singularity theorems has a set of preconditions to it or set of conditions. And so uh, that particular one has the notion that general relativity is valid and that energy behaves a certain way, that effectively there's more gravitational energy than repulsive gravitational energy. And you also need some mass in the universe. Well, that plays into that energy condition. Right. Yeah. And so, but what that means is that as powerful as that theorem is, if general relativity is not correct, or if energy doesn't behave a certain way, the theorem no longer applies. And so I realized that a lot of this discussion about the beginning of the universe is uh, asking the question, what are what are the sorts of theorems we can develop, and do they actually apply? And uh, you know, you and I both know that as of this point in time, the that energy condition is violated by inflation. And so, if inflation happened, the Hawking-Penrose singularity theorem no longer applies to the universe. Well, what I find the, the particular paper that I wanted to talk about, it was a paper called "The Generalized Second Law Implies a Quantum Singularity Theorem" by Aaron Wall. And he's addressing that particular issue of, okay, the singularity theorems of Hawking and Penrose don't apply to the beginning because inflation violates the energy condition. And quite honestly, a lot of scientists, uh, myself included, think something beyond general relativity is needed. And so it may be that that, that, uh, quantum gravity theory that that singularity theorem no longer applies if quantum gravity is a question. This is an extension to the theorem from Arvind Borde, Alan Guth, and Alexander Lincoln, where they took on the inflationary issue 
this is actually going beyond that. Well, well, it's in that class of it's in right. that class of uh, developments, and it's actually going back to not so much the Hawking Penrose theorem, but Penrose had another theorem uh, that was just relied on the second law of thermodynamics to argue that there's a pass boundary. But again, you run into this question or this problem where you're dealing with quantum mechanical effects that the theorem no longer holds. And so what uh, Aaron Wall was trying to do is say, uh, well, when you're dealing with black holes, because that's where a lot of this work is developed, and right. then what goes forward in a black hole generally is applying in reverse as you're, you're dealing with time in the universe, uh, was developing a generalized second law of thermodynamics where you're talking about the amount of entropy and what do we know. And it turns out there's different ways of looking at entropy. You can look at entropy as the amount of stuff that I don't know, uh, which is one way of looking at entropy. Or there's a you can look at entropy as the amount of stuff that can just cannot be known, uh, which the, the latter is a more constant quantity, which what I don't know can change and grow over time. Um, and so he's just looking at generalizing that, that law of entropy or how entropy behaves. And the, the bottom line of what he's found out is that he can develop this generalized second law, which applies to uh, gravita or, you know, applies to singularities and event horizons. And, this sing and the reason that why he wanted to do this was to investigate, does this strengthen or weaken the singularity theorems developed by Penrose? And lo and behold, what he found was that this generalization of the second law actually strengthens the case for there being a beginning. Right. Now it does raise some interesting things because that second or that theorem by Penrose uh, only applies if the universe is spatially infinite, and so uh, you know this generalized second law would apply a singularity assuming the universe is spatially infinite. But uh, you know I think that's a reasonable way to look at our universe, and despite the fact that uh, theologians and philosophers and mathematicians and physicists all look at infinities very differently and whether they can exist or not. But what I find the, the thing that I found fascinating and encouraging about this is there's this idea out there in uh, cosmology and in the scientific discussion today that once we find that proper quantum theory of gravity, we're no longer going to have a beginning and, and, and by implication, the Bible will inaccurately describe the universe. What this paper is showing is that uh, even though we don't have that proper theory of gravity, yet, quantum theory of gravity, uh, there's still a lot of indications that when we do find it, that these these singularity theorems are still going to hold. We're going to have evidence of a singularity. And that points to the idea that the Bible is correct. And it actually shows that uh, when we start incorporating those quantum effects into our models, into our calculations, we still get the singularities. And so it kind of strengthens the case. At the very minimum, it makes the case that it's reasonable to think that there's a singularity and the Bible describes creation accurately. And if the last hundred years is accurate, the more we investigate, the stronger that conclusion is going to be. So I just found that a pretty exciting, encouraging, and fascinating dis discovery. Yeah, it is great. I mean, you know, looking at what he wrote there, it's like he says, okay, it depends on the universe being spatially infinite. We'll never know that mm -hmm. because there's a limit to how accurately we can measure the geometry of the universe. Right. It measures flat to about four places of the decimal. That's about as best we're ever going to do. But I no noted what he wrote there was that, hey, that's good enough. The fact that it's close, uh, you know, we got flat to four places of decimal, that still means that this theorem is in good shape because uh, we know it's not uh, a, a, a closed system to a high degree. So, right. Well, and, and you know, that what, it, what, it's, what I like about this is that, uh, you know, and even as I've read some stuff that Wallace said about this, it's not like he's saying, oh, I've proved that there's a beginning. What he said is that, you know, here, here's a way to look at things. We know we need to expand general relativity to include quantum mechanical effects into gravity. Here's an approach of how to think about that, particularly looking at the second law of thermodynamics and how entropy behaves. And noting that even in quantum mechanical situations or the, the quantum mechanical places where it shows in, there are, there are weak quantum mechanical effects. And so he would, it gives a reason to think that this particular... Uh, theorems, even when extended where we have that full quantum theory of gravity, are still going to apply, that, the, that those new developments aren't going to invalidate this, assuming this generalized second law is, is a way to look at it. And so it, it, in total, it provides a, an argument that as we find that quantum theory of gravity, it really is going to point to a beginning, 
which is which is, to me provides a response to the people who say you know hey I can find this quantum theory of gravity uh, might be correct and it doesn't have a beginning and this one and it doesn't have a beginning and this one and it doesn't have a beginning and, and my question in that has kind of always been I, it doesn't surprise me that you can find quantum theories of gravity that don't have a beginning but what I don't know is of if you're going to make a conclusion you got to say of of the types of theories that are out there which ones have a beginning and which ones don't what this paper is showing is that there's a large class of quantum theories of gravity that are still going to point to there's this singularity that points Moreover, to a beginning. they're the ones that look the most reasonable. Well, if yeah. God created things, that's what I'm going to expect. You know, you always like to put predictions on things. As we investigate more, the ones that have the singularities are going to be the ones that match the observations we make. Now, it may take 100 years to get observations on what that quantum theory of gravity is going to be. But nonetheless, I expect that to hold true. Yeah, and moreover, we may never get a complete uh, you know, quantum gravity theory. So, however, as we're pushing, we're seeing that it's going in a theistic direction. I presume you've been following, too, the exchanges between Aaron Wall and Sean Carroll. That's been going on for, gee, the past six years. Uh, there are different theorems going because he's right. You know, Sean Carroll's got the quantum eternity theorem. Right. Aaron Wall's got his uh, you know theorem based on the second law of thermodynamics. Right. And I have appreciated that their dialogue with one another has been respectful. Mm -hmm. uh, that's been good. But what caught my attention as an astronomer is it seems like what's separating them is that Sean Carroll needs the quantum space-time fluctuations in the quantum gravity era to be really large. Mm -hmm. And if you have the second law of thermodynamics applying, they wouldn't be that large. Okay. And what's exciting about that is that is actually something that's potentially testable. Right. In the sense that uh, that has effects, impacts on the event horizons of black holes. It also has effects on the image quality of distant quasars and blazars. Mm -hmm. And there's already been observations that have been made that says, hey, we know that these quantum space-time fluctuations can't be extremely large. Mm -hmm. So it's basically pushing the realm the realm of speculation for people like Sean Carroll into a smaller box. You know, yeah. 10 years ago they had a little more room to speculate, now they've got a lot less room to speculate. Well, as I, as I look at this, this to me this raises something that as a scientist it it, it makes sense that it happens, but I, I think it it's something that when you look outside or people looking outside could draw the wrong conclusion. Is that, you know, you've got Sean Carroll, who's a very talented scientist. I really like and enjoy, I mean, personally, I just enjoy listening to and engaging his work. But, you know, very accomplished and very talented scientist. You've got Aaron Wall, I put in the same category. Um, you've got these two people that seem to come at this with a different worldview, that in some sense, uh, and, and this isn't a pejorative, but it looks it looks very weird, is that I think in some sense, Sean Carroll wants to find a universe where there isn't a beginning. And my suspicion is Wall probably wants to find a universe where there is a beginning. And, and they've both been pretty upfront about that, that, that declaration. Well, they've laid their theological cards on it, the table. Exactly. So, so it's... There's this idea that science is kind of done almost robotically by Spock, never let any sort of preference or uh, emotional thing get in the way. And the reality is people are scientists or scientists are people. And here they have, you know, you really are kind of testing these worldviews and battling it out because I think whether there's a beginning or not, if you have a naturalistic worldview or a, or, or a theistic worldview, that you're going to get different conclusions on whether there's a beginning there or not, or, or you know, which of those which of those is going to be correct. And to have that battle out, that there's ways to have that discussion scientifically that upholds the integrity of science, but yet there are still these worldview issues at play. And, and I think that's, I, I don't want to leave the impression that, oh, scientists are just driven by what they want to believe. I think that would be an easy conclusion, but wrong conclusion to draw. But I'm just kind of curious, what are your thoughts on that? Because there, it does seem like there are worldview issues in play more than just kind of this objective scientific enterprise. Well, you know, I always like to put things to some kind of a test. Mm -hmm. And I'm really praying that before the Hubble Space Telescope finally stops functioning, it will. I mean, yeah. it's been amazing how long it's been functioning. But one more thing I really want them to make sure they do, because that Hubble Space Telescope can make observations at relatively short ultraviolet wavelengths. Mm -hmm. And they've used it already to put a limit on these quantum space-time fluctuations observing a blazar 
three billion light years away. Right. And they saw that the image was sharp, which means the quantum space-time fluctuations can't be large. But the more distantly you observe an object, and the shorter the wavelength you observe the object, mm -hmm. the better constraint you get. Right. The Hubble Space Telescope can do the same thing at 10 or 12 billion light years. Mm -hmm. So let's get it done. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, I, well, and, and that's ex the exciting thing is, that, and what I love about science, it's not that worldviews don't come into play, but as you're saying, there's ways to go out and test it. There's ways to go out and test it. Science is not a bunch of objective people doing things. Science is a bunch of people who have thoughts and beliefs about what's going on, but who are willing to subject their ideas to scrutiny to see which ones match the real world. And, and that is what I love about what Reasons to Believe is about. It's about, hey, how can we go out and test and show that Christianity is a true Belief, not a just something we believe because we want to. Well, something else I'd say about worldview that I think we're on the same page with is that, hey, uh, these worldviews uh, can be tested, but we can never. I mean, I run into atheist scientists who say, I'm not going to believe in your God until we know all possible speculation that would support a non God existence or ruled out. And it's like, that'll never happen. Mm -hmm. That's like coming to me and saying, hey, uh, provide me with absolute proof that my wife exists. Mm -hmm. I got lots of practical proof, but not absolute proof. And uh, so if that's a condition, I, I can never satisfy that. Right. On the other hand, we can say, hey, we are pushing back the frontiers of scientific knowledge. As we push back those frontiers, how is your worldview doing? And if it's not meeting the pushback of the frontiers, maybe you need to give serious consideration to an alternate worldview. So I'm excited about these advances in theoretical astrophysics, as well as these advances in what the Hubble Space Telescope can do to put constraints on this, because I think it might encourage people, okay, I've been backed up into a smaller corner of speculation. Maybe I need to reconsider my worldview. Yeah, it's, I, I'm excited about what's going on. And, and you know, it's, it's just interesting. I've been doing science long enough that I can see how ideas that were very prevalent have changed dramatically. I mean, you know, even just the idea of a multiverse or inflation, those were talked about, but not really accepted ideas. And just how the how as science has progressed, the, the thoughts on whether those are true and correct has really changed. So I'm kind of excited about that. Well, I am too. I'm, I'm, <laughs> You've been doing it longer than I have. <laughs> I have, but I'm, I'm just looking, I mean, for example, inflation. I think we're really close to determining what kind of inflation event happened. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited about the fine tuning that's going to reveal. Right. So we live in exciting times. It is. <laughs> this is my favorite century to live in. I'm glad I'm living in it. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> so, well, hey, I know you've got a discussion right. about uh, oxygen, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so. this is completely different from uh, you know theoretical astrophysics. Uh, it's a paper that got published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, 12 authors. Uh, it was published uh, literally just February 8th, so just mm -hmm. a few days ago uh, this got uh, published. And uh, to kind of put it in context, I'm going to have people see a slide that I prepared here. And probably a lot of you have seen this slide before. It's in a lot of my talks. But I want to pay attention. This is the oxygenation history of Earth's atmosphere. Uh, where for the first two and a half billion years, the oxygen content was like about one ten thousandth of what it is today. So this it, graph is even wrong because it shows it about 1% there when it's yeah, really effectively nothing. It is way <laughs> below that, but yeah. I gotcha. <laughs> I couldn't use a logarithmic scale, so that's what I did. So it was really low, and then you got the what's called the great oxygenation event, uh, where it bumps up anywhere from 1% to 2 to 3%. Right. Uh, oxygen content in the atmosphere. But I want you to look at that dotted line. That dotted line above a billion and a half years uh, is a region where we just don't have good data mm -hmm. on uh, what the oxygen content in Earth's atmosphere was. And this paper addresses that. This is finally, we got a proxy for oxygen that is reliable, that tells us what's going on in that dotted line area. And this has significant consequences for how we interpret the fossil record and how we uh, determine, okay, what's responsible for the big changes in uh, life on planet Earth. Well, uh, if I could ask a question, 
it's hard to, uh, you, you mentioned that oh, there for that period of time, it seems odd that we have it for way back 4 billion years ago, but we don't have it a billion years ago. What is it that makes that particular era challenging to find the oxygen content? And quite honestly, how do you find it 4 billion years ago? It's not like you got samples of atmosphere. It's not, uh, but would you have these proxies? And this which, is which is, explain what a proxy is. Uh, it's, it's basically a measurement that has a correlation with what you want to measure. Okay. So, I mean, to give an example, if you want to measure, uh, say, uh, the temperature in the last few thousand years, you can look at the ratio of oxygen 16 to 17 to 18, and that will tell you uh, the temperature uh, in the atmosphere. So that's how we get uh, global mean temperatures uh, from ice cores, for example. So presumably in that last that two and a half or 2.7 to 4 billion years, uh, it, there's just, it's just been hard to find something that we can measure that correlates with oxygen content. And, well, and this is what this paper is addressing. This is what this paper is addressed. Basically, it's making the point that why we have a dotted line there is that the proxies we've been using are the abundance of cerium in uh, sediments just off the shores of uh, the continents, mm -hmm. and then also looking at uh, chromium. Those are the two that we've been used. And about six, six pages of this paper is explaining why that's been problematic. Okay. Why we've had to put a dotted line there because some of the measurements indicate, hey, uh, we may have as much as a 5% oxygen in the atmosphere. Measurements in a different area at the same time say, no, it's down around 0.1%. Uh, uh, okay. So you've got literally a factor of 100 difference. And uh, so they pulled in cerium. They said, hey, it's just as problematic. Well, what this paper is introducing, they says we've found a proxy that gets rid of all these problems. And uh, it's uh, iron two. Okay. And uh, the value of iron is, iron is an abundant uh, element mm -hmm. in earth. You know, 5% of the earth is, uh, is iron. Uh, so, uh, and iron's everywhere. Right. And uh, iron two especially gives you a good measure of how much oxygen is in the upper part of the uh, ocean. And uh, the interest here is that the first evidence for animal life is in the shallow ocean environments. Okay. And so they're basically looking at sediments uh, offshore uh, where you've got shallow ocean water, uh, looking at the amount of iron too, and say this will tell you whether you've got partial oxidation of the sediments or complete oxidation. Mm -hmm. If you've got complete oxidation, you're looking at 8% oxygen in the atmosphere or more. If you've got less, uh, you've got quite a bit. And if it's really partial everywhere, it means you're way below 1%. Okay, so so basically they've got a something they can measure because its sedimentation is gonna stick around for a while Right. that will sample what the oxygenation of the ocean is, which is correlated with what's going on in the atmosphere. Exactly. And it's uh, ubiquitous in that it's, so it's all around the earth. Um, it's also in the particular environment where animals first appeared. And so it's just, it's, it's a good, uh, measure of the amount of oxygen and allows you to tell up you know so you I think you said if it's fully ox or fully oxidized that means we've got oxygen content in the atmosphere eight percent or more and then presumably you can get some sort of measure of how much based on how oxidized it is that's exactly. the basic process that's the basic <clears throat> process and okay. then like cerium and chromium it's a complete record okay because iron is so abundant you're gonna have the proxy because that was the problem with the cerium is mm. it's a relatively rare element and it may be there just isn't any at all in that environment. Gotcha. In which case you don't get a measurement. Well, yeah, and that, that does, you know, my immediate question when you said you found it in places, well, it's lower here and higher there. Are you measuring just regional effects? Whereas with the iron, presumably its ubiquity allows you to get a much better handle on that. That's effect. exactly what's going on. That's why this paper is so exciting because it says, okay, we can get rid of that dotted line. Nice, okay. <laughs> and that we actually know what's going on. And what they discovered was, you've got less than 0.2% oxygen in the atmosphere uh, from the end of the great oxygenation event, which is about 2.6 uh, you know, uh, uh, billion years uh, after the formation of the Earth, up until uh, about uh, you know, 600, or pardon me, 900. They know from about uh, 2. Point, uh, well, 2 billion years ago okay. uh, to about 900,000 years ago, it was definitely less than 0.2% oxygen in the atmosphere everywhere on the Earth. 
Okay, so so from about two billion years ago to about nine hundred nine hundred thousand nine hundred thousand nine hundred million nine hundred. I assume about a billion years ago. No, pardon me, nine hundred million. Yeah, okay, all right, okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry. Thank okay, you for so, correcting so that. for that billion years, we know it's fairly low, is what they're saying. Saying it's really, yeah, quite okay. low. And then from nine hundred million years to seven hundred and fifty million years. They see it going up slightly. Okay. Although the debate is, did it start 900 million years ago or did it start 750 million years mm -hmm. ago? Uh, but they do see that something's happening in that range. Right. So we need more measurements to determine exactly when the onset is. Uh, but when they look at the fossil record, they notice that you start moving from just microbes uh, to you know really tiny eukaryotic life forms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And those are the light forms that need more than 0.2% oxygen in the atmosphere. They begin to show up somewhere between 690 and 700 million years ago. Okay. And so the paper ends by saying we see a really tight correlation between the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere and the minimum oxygen that these creatures need and when they appear. So, so if so, th that that seems to be the place where this okay might connect with what scripture has to say. Because yes. um, if if I get what you're saying, the creature, you know, the larger the animals, you know, the eukaryotic and and larger <laughs> organisms, uh, they need oxygen because that's basically basically what allows uh, higher energy transfer to happen. Uh, you know, it's a little more complicated than that, but. Um, so the mapping the oxygen content of the atmosphere is really important because that's going to weigh in on when could these animals exist. And so, so what's the connection with what scripture has to say there? So we know the larger bodied animals need oxygen. We now know that there wasn't any oxygen in this period. So what? Well, what this paper is showing is that the moment you've got enough oxygen to support small eukaryotic life forms, they show up right away. Okay. Uh, which means that there's no time delay between the conditions that are necessary for those life forms to exist mm. and when they appear. Uh, and then you see in this graph that you got a sudden jump from about oh one and a half percent up to eight percent. That's called the Avalon explosion, uh, where you now no longer have these tiny eukaryotic life forms or tiny sponges. Some sponges can get by with less than eight percent mm -hmm. oxygen. There's some evidence in the fossil record. They show up previous uh, to 575 uh, mm -hmm. million years ago. But 575 million years ago is when you have this sudden proliferation of animals that are as big as two meters across. Right. But they're animals without digestive tracts, okay. without a circulatory system. They're basically filter feeding animals. Think of giant sponges, jellyfish type creatures. Those are the ones. So these are not cats up. and dogs. These are much, no. much more primitive, large, but still relatively primitive. They're large, uh, relatively primitive, but they need 8% oxygen gotcha. to okay. survive. But the moment we get 8% oxygen, they suddenly appear, and they suddenly appear uh, in great diversity. It's not like you just get a single species. So, so, it, so it seems like the, the, the significance of this is, okay, we measure that there are these large organisms in the Avalon and then ultimately in the Cambrian where the oxygen levels go up. If the oxygen levels had been up higher, oh, there's an environment, things could evolve and become in there. The fact that it happens, the oxygenation seems to correspond almost with when they show up. It's not like they're just developing. It's like, well, the way I say, God's prepared it and then he introduced the animals. Yeah, what a lot of non-theistic evolution and biologists speculated is the oxygen uh, jumped up first. Mm -hmm. Then there was a period of time in which evolution allowed the appearance of uh, animal life forms that could actually take advantage of that oxygen. Because presumably those are some pretty significant changes to, to be able to use oxygen as energy oh, as yeah. opposed to not oxygen. Right. So. Yeah, the, these are major changes. And mm -hmm. of course, from a non-theistic perspective, you're going to need a lot of time mm -hmm. for mutations and natural selection, gene exchange, epigenetics to be able to transform uh, these right. creatures where they can take advantage of that oxygen. This is demonstrating we don't see any time. 
the moment the oxygen hits that minimum level, these creatures appear. Okay, so presumably the thought would have been from the great oxygenation event where you've got one, maybe 2% of oxygen, that for the next couple billion, or that, that billion years, the oxygen would have just steadily increased up to 8%, which gives time for animals to adjust and adapt and evolve to the increasing oxygen. What this paper is showing is that while the great oxygenation event went up, it dropped back down to very low levels and remained that up until well, about 900 million years Jeff, ago. Jeff, this is actually related to the discovery you were talking about, because what you have are people from a non-theistic perspective taking advantage of regions of ignorance. So okay. just like, okay, hey, we don't really know what's going on to any great degree of precision in the quantum gravity era. Therefore, we think we're free to speculate non-theistic ideas. Same thing happened here. People took a look at that dotted line and said, oh, well, maybe things weren't low. Maybe mm -hmm. we had lots of oxygen in that area, uh, in that uh, time region, and that would give us the time we need for our naturalistic models to produce what they do. Well, that, that seems like actually a really good a way to approach it scientifically, is to say, okay, we've got this measurement, and if our non-theistic model is correct, we would expect this to happen, and so then the the... The idea is, and let's go out and figure out how to test it, and found it out, and lo and behold, the test seems to indicate that the requirements they were looking for weren't there. Right. And for 30 years, uh, geophysicists and geochemists have been wanting to get that data. Mm -hmm. Now we have it. I mean, it's been a long wait. And so I've been showing this dotted line for a good 20 years. I don't have to show a dotted line anymore. You can put the rest of the dots I in can there, can't exactly, you? Exactly, <laughs> yeah. So I'm excited about this. Well, I mean, you know, both, both of these discoveries, what I find fascinating about them are that there's, uh, you know, you, you could put that in a very pejorative uh, explanation. Of, oh, there are people who don't want God to exist, and they're just putting forth all these theories to get away from God. But the reality of what, as I read what they're doing, is they're saying, hey, if, the, if we're going to make an explanation that works, this is what's going to have to happen. And that actually provides... Uh, that provides a hypothesis, if you will, that we can go out and test, and it helps direct where our experiments go. What I find exciting is that as we do those tests, it seems to confirm what I would expect from a theistic perspective. But it's really exciting that you know both theistic and non-theistic scientists are engaging in these topics and helping drive knowledge forward, so that we can make a we have more information to make a, a decision on how things actually work. That's pretty exciting. Uh, kind of regardless of which conclusion you end up with. It is. And that's kind of the mission of science. Get rid of all the dotted lines. <laughs> right. <laughs> or as many as we can. Right. Well, that's a pretty cool discovery, Hugh. I appreciate that sharing that with us. Oh, yeah, well, good. Well, this kind of wraps up our episode of uh, Stars, Cells, and uh, God. And I encourage you to uh, go to our YouTube channel. Uh, we post all these there. You can look at them anytime you want. And then go to RTB uh, underscore official. That's where you can engage uh, our ministry through social media. And uh, Jeff, I know you've got a Facebook and Twitter page. I've got one. All the scholars here have one. You can go there and uh, post questions. Don't guarantee we're going to answer them right away, but we'll do the best we can to answer your questions. Uh, so please visit those different sites. Thanks.